Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Uh, I'm here with my co-host, Sally Meyer, who helps lead our segment on energy and climate. And we're very excited about our interview today. We'll be touching on a wide range of issues in green energy investments, clean tech. Uh, we'll cover modular nukes, uh, greenwashing issues, uh, social justice and development uh, in uh, climate change investing, uh, how, whether there are patient capital in this arena, uh, what is the development on electric vehicles, the barriers, the speed of adoption, uh, and also talking about tree planting work in Africa and other uh, very exciting projects coming up in this nation. And our guest today, I'm very excited to, to announce, is Bill Bonnet. He is the chair of the advisory board of the Smithsonian. Environmental Research Center, and he served from 2009 to 2018 as a member of the National Board of the Smithsonian Institution, uh, which, as you may know, is the world's largest museum and research complex. Uh, Bill also sits on the executive committee of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness, uh, it, which, which is a nonpartisan NGO working on national competitiveness issues. He's also a board member of the American Forest, which is uh, the, the nation's oldest conservation organization. Uh, Mr. Bonnet, thank you so much for joining Sully and, and me today. Uh, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a privilege for me also. Uh, perhaps we'll start with uh, just your background. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about who you are? Because uh, there are other titles in your resume that I did not get to get to mention. You also worked in finance and have just a very long career uh, in the intersection of, of business and climate. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you again for having me. Um, came to Prince in 1966, graduated in 70 from what was then the Woodrow Wilson School and now the School of Public and International Affairs. And I mentioned that because in my case, that was quite formative. I, uh, for me to get the opportunity to get a cross-disciplinary perspective on policy issues uh, was uh, was formative for me. And although I didn't use it in, in the beginning part of my career, I found as my career progressed, uh, I, I was able to draw on its lessons and its the, per, the broadened perspectives that it gave me. So I'm, I'm very much a, uh, a fan of that kind of Princeton uh, education that I was fortunate enough to receive. I went to law school. I began a, a, a very much a white bread uh, corporate lawyer kind of existence, practicing law at Wall Street um, throughout the 70s and 80s. Uh, became a partner uh, in a major firm, and I think the first first assignment, if you will, or first first sort of revelation in that otherwise uh, very satisfying and very remunerative, but, but uh, not particularly uh, newsworthy kind of career was, was having the good fortune to uh, get a Filipino American woman named Lilia Clemente as a client who uh, came over, was an immigrant, came over, went to University of Chicago Business School, and started a number of Asian-oriented uh, uh, mutual funds, private private equity funds. Um, uh, we had a country fund, the first Philippine fund, which was quite thrilling for me, because we we ended up having 17 trips to the Philippines in the 90s and early 2000s, and I met every president of the Philippines, and really. For a kid from the Midwest, for me to get that kind of exposure to an to a developing Asian country was exceptionally eye-opening and valuable. So it was a big break for me uh, that I I was aware at the time of how I was changing because I because of this the fortuitousness of uh, having this kind of client. So. Many trips to, uh, we had trips to China, Korea, Japan, Thailand, but mostly the Philippines. So that was extraordinary. And that in turn led to uh, 
becoming exposed through through uh, uh, Lily is good influences to uh, a woman named Peggy Delaney, who was then and now head of something called Synergos, uh, really a Rockefeller. She was a Rockefeller, David Rockefeller's daughter. And that furthered the international piece of my education and really continued to broaden my perspectives. I had the wonderful uh, happenstance and mid-career of, of a, uh, a brother, a genius then and a genius now who, who uh, uh, invented GeoCities, which was, a, which was an internet community company and in the 90s and really sort of a precursor to Facebook. And that was yet another highlight that gave me uh, another leg up into the world of philanthropy, into the world of uh, uh, doing the kinds of nonprofit work I've, I've been doing. So for the last 20 years, as I've transitioned out of law into philanthropy, I find that uh, the Princeton experience and the international experience really took me beyond my previous Midwestern boundaries. And it's, it was instrumental, I think, in, in letting me see the world in a fundamentally different way. And that I think will be reflected uh, in this discussion. Uh, one thing led to another, the Smithsonian, and the Smithsonian led to the council and onward and onward from there. Um, also, in addition to the ones you mentioned, uh, I'm the board chair of an NGO working on African renewables uh, called Little Sun. And I'm a member of what's called the Energy Security Leadership Council, which is uh, uh, 35 generals and me. So how I got there is another matter, but uh, it, it works on national security issues relating to energy. Uh, and I'm delighted to be a part of that. So it's a wide ranging portfolio on renewables and energy and sustainability. And I guess that's what brought me here. So I'm delighted to be here and delighted to dig into the subjects that uh, you have. We should really jump right in, Mr. Bonac, because th there's so many things we could talk about. But I guess to give our listeners a quick background, we got to really know each other through uh, a recent lecture you did with the Gilbert Lecture Series, which was a Princeton lecture series that tried to bring innovative leaders in business and government together and share their insights uh, at Princeton. And, you know, previous speakers are like Meg, Meg Whitman, uh, Jeff Bezos. So they really try to curate a list of, of people every year to, to bring forth innovate, innovative ideas. So maybe would you mind giving us a quick interview what you talked about? I think the, la the lecture was just about a week ago, so. Sure, it, we tried to touch on a lot uh, and it was, uh, uh, it was a privilege uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to, to review it. I, I gave it, I think, it, an overall premise that now is a moment of cautious optimism and it's a moment of real hope for the first time in a number of years with the Biden administration uh, uh, renewing our commitment to compliance with the Paris Accords uh, and a bullion stock market, which seems uh, willing and able to uh, look beyond the pandemic and into growth areas of the future. And this is, and renewables are certainly one of them. Uh, I, I touched on uh, what I see as an important part of evaluating what we're trying to do on sustainability, and that is to combine uh, work on, for, for example, in, in trees, it will be not only planting trees, but doing something, doing a, a social justice program that we call tree equity, where we are, are uh, planting trees in underserved areas and trying to provide career pathways. And I use that to illustrate the point that we're all going to be better off and the transition will be easier if we think of how we can combine 
the work of renewables and working towards a cleaner energy future with what I would term the broader public good of building a more sustainable society. So the trees were a good example. In Africa, uh, we, we are not only working on personal solar devices, uh, but integral to our approach of bringing light to, uh, to uh, off-grid areas where about 700 million people in Africa do not have access to electricity, emphasizing gender equity with women small stakeholder farmers and trying to combine attacking a number of the UN sustainable development goals, not just energy, but education and gender equality and economic development generally. So I think it's a useful construct that, that I've been fortunate enough to have a couple of different examples on where combining, combining not only not only the, the goal, the overriding goal of creating a cleaner energy future, but doing it in such a way that we build a more sustainable world and improve quality of life it, at the same time. Uh, so that was an important theme of the Gilbert. Uh, and I, I think those were well, probably what we should start with at least in looking at looking down the road. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, and I remember you talked about in your Gilbert lecture um, how America has a lot of available capital, especially right now. Um, and that available capital would work well being applied to green technology um, and for that matter, social justice. Um, now, do you like expect companies to put that money forward to green technology uh, just in their own, and, and social justice for that matter, uh, in their own self-interest or do you, expect there to be some kind of like government mechanism kind of forcing them in that direction or encouraging them to go in that direction? Well, I think the, you know, the answer, the answer now is a combination of both, of course. Um, and we have, we have a pretty clear roadmap and I was just reading The Economist today and they're giving two thumbs up out of three to the Biden administration plan, feeling only that it would have been better off uh, emphasizing putting a price on carbon rather than what it has done in terms of uh, encouraging energy efficiency. That said, and we can talk more about that, but what we have now is a plan that, that spends a, a great deal of money creating incentives and subsidies for clean energy development uh, in many different areas. So it is certainly going to be an activist government over the next several years which will try and incent activities on the on corporate corporations, which will lead to a more rapid adoption of clean energy tech. So that's for sure. And combining with that, and I'm by no means an expert on ESG, but we have a very robust ESG movement on the investment side here, where more and more Wall Street uh, portfolio managers and institutional money managers are asking and in some cases mandating corporations uh, adopt robust ESG guidelines and adhere to those as part of their uh, corporate investments. So I think the combination of the two creates for the first time in years, frankly, creates some real momentum for enhanced investment in clean energy. Uh, Mr. Bonnet, just to quickly follow up on that, I think what Sully was uh, trying to also get at is uh, this big stock market boom that we're seeing, especially with respect to uh, the renewables slash energy sector. There's been this boom with, with the sustainable transportation startups. There's a lot of concerns that have been voiced that we are really building the quote unquote, the new dot-com bubble. And the idea is basically saying that even if some of those companies do represent the future, the stocks are wildly overpriced. And when the bubble burst, it will really dampen the green transition. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Are we in this kind of bubbly environment that actually ultimately helps with innovations? Or do you think if it bursts, it will actually hurt people's enthusiasm uh, and optimism? 
I, I, you know what? It's I, I really, I really find when you reach this age and you live through so many stock market ups and downs, I, I think this is pretty analogous to '99, and '99, uh, 2000, which I lived through every thrilling moment of it, from the boom to the bust. And you know what happened? Uh, and the same thing basically happened, uh, you know, in the in the market this time. Uh, the the the, the boom leading to rather a, a historic internet boom in the 90s during the Clinton administration, leading to a rather dramatic bust in 2000. But you know what the reality was? That yes, it did wash out a number of companies for sure, uh, but a number of companies remained, including the company that we were fortunate enough to be bought out by. And that is Yahoo. So let's just look at yeah, look what happened to Yahoo. Stock went from 30 to 270, complete round trip and below, back down to 10. And yet all the time in business. And by 2003, it was back up to 30. And I think it ultimately got to about split and got to about 60. So what does that tell you? That tells you that companies that actually have a business, they ride through a bubble. They, they, uh, if they, if they don't have a, a viable, sustainable business model, they will, uh, and the and the market, uh, you know, goes down 30, 40, 50 percent all at once. Yes, a number of them might survive, but I'm, I've lived through so many markets where where the death knell has been struck and it never, it never wipes out every company. It, it, it preserves some value in companies that end up surviving. You take the modern equivalent. Um, I think the, uh, the, the M MP, what is it called? MP, the, uh, the, uh, Rare Earth Mineral Mining Company just got a five hundred million dollar valuation from a SPAC. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what? You know what? We we need, and we can get into this. We need a robust supply chain of domestically sourced rare earths. That's beyond that's beyond doubt. And you've got five hundred million dollars worth of not dumb money willing to bet that this will be the company that can do it. Will it be, or will it be the next company uh, coming down the road that'll have a better business model and better execution? But I, I will, I will bet you it'll be one or more of them. So the underlying, the internet didn't go away in two, the year two thousand. It, it, it spawned, uh, it, it spawned failures, but it also spawned huge successes in Facebook and Google on the heels of the bust. Who would have guessed that two of our most valuable companies would have been formed in the immediate aftermath of the bust? Think about that. In 2000, uh, in 2000, widespread pessimism that, that the internet would never rise again. It rose again within two years with the founding of Google, which is now one of the most five valuable companies in the, in the world. Amazon was founded in 95. It went through a, a real dip in 2000, but kept growing, kept to its business plan, and is now the most valuable company in the world. So have the courage to look through uh, that awful day that's coming when the market might dip 25% in a day and know that there will be winners and survivors as well as losers. I, I guess the challenge in these times is that it's very hard to predict where this technological innovation could take us, right? Because if you say Tesla will eventually take over the electric vehicle market, or as you said, this $500 million company, that, that if this is the company that's going to overtake this rare earth mining space, then of course you should, you, 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 those valuations are very justified and you could, you could go on forever. But so, so yes, the, the challenges are, are, are vast. Um, but, but I guess just to quickly follow up on that, um, do, 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 do you feel like the, the huge amount of capital right now being devoted to it are somewhat sufficient? Or do, or do you think there's still a lot of more investments that need to be made, both on the private side or the 
um, public side, um, because there seems to be a conflicting narrative these days. On one side, people say, oh my God, there's so much capital going in. And on one side, people say, oh, there's not enough capital going in. We need to invest more in green energy. So uh, from, from an insider perspective, where do you see uh, we are at right now when it comes to green tech investments? Well, let, 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 let's, take, let's take an easy one from my standpoint, an easy one to analyze. Uh, and that would be electric vehicles. So, um, and now two years ago, we might have, or three years ago or five years ago, we might've been having a different discussion, but we're not, here we are. And it is beyond doubt that electric vehicles will, uh, will be a massive new continuing opportunity. Take a step back. Why is that? Is it at base, is it because it's going to be a worse driving experience? Is it because it's going to be a, uh, a less economic driving experience? Is it going to be because it eventually, or it'll always be a more expensive driving experience? What's the obvious answers? In each case, no. I mean, we are headed towards objectively cars that will be more economical to drive, cars that will be easier to maintain, and cars that will be, forget climate change per se, be, will be far less polluting. China has a huge, China and India have huge automobile driven pollution problems, just the way Los Angeles did 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So I'd start by saying, if you look at the electric vehicle market objectively, we're going to a better automotive future. Okay. In, in one sense, without being facetious, the rest is all details. Mr. or Miss, now we're into Miss Market, not Mr. Market. The, market. the market always sorts out winners and losers, always sorts out, takes, takes a thousand adjustments a day on battery technology, on uh, the rate of whether China is squeezing us on rare earths. Is there a scandal at Volkswagen? Is Mercedes moving too fast or slow? How about GM? Shouldn't they be doing different things? That's a function of, of the market. You're going to have 10 or 12 major players in the electric vehicle space. Some are going to be winners. In addition to Tesla, some are going to be losers. And the market is a marvelous capital allocator. And it's choosing right now to allocate capital to Tesla in a way that you know has was rarely been seen. So you you can agree or disagree that the capital allocation, if you will, to Tesla seems to be a little bit excessive. Um, but you know they're they're growing rapidly. They're building factories in Germany and Austin, Texas, as well as China. So it's hard it's hard to bet against Tesla in the long run. Is the short-term valuation a little excessive? No doubt. So the electric vehicles are a good example of the market coming to grips with a major new class of assets, so to speak. You take that to be, you know, auto, you're gonna, you're gonna break it down into, into pieces. And companies like Tesla are getting a premium valuation you know, Tiger, ask yourself the, the following question. If, if, if Ford announced tomorrow they were going to take a bigger than expected write-off charge to uh, accelerate their electric vehicle rollout, and they already have an ambitious one, but let's say they doubled that, what would you guess would happen? Do you think the market would go up or down? In other words, it's going to cost Ford in the short run. It's going to cost Ford a lot of money to retool these factories and to prematurely switch, if you will, from gasoline powered vehicles to electric vehicles. But what do you think the market would do? I, I think the market would go, the Ford would be more valuable rather than less valuable because the market always looks ahead. And, and now in five years, in five years, if that investment by Ford was a complete flop, the stock comes back to earth. But right now, the, the market is convinced that the future is very bright for electrics. And you're seeing that reflected in the valuations. And, and you could even say that uh, 
the markets will ultimately reward the ones who actually innovate and, and, and push us to there. So if, if you, you are a business in the very long term, you should ultimately be incentivized to push out the truly great innovations that will take us to the green future and you will be rewarded as a great business. And, and sure, there will be a lot of small winners and bubbly things right now, but you know, 10, 20 years down the road, uh, only true innovations will be rewarded and they will be. Uh, clearly. Yeah, um, I want to talk about the EV market kind of as like a stand in for the economy as a whole, um, because you are seeing a lot of these startups. I mean, Tesla is like the name brand, but like Rivian, Lucid Motors, uh, a few from China um, coming in and like getting to places quicker than the big three in Detroit and the big three in Germany. Um, and for instance, like Ford is doing contracts with Rivian to make electric pickups. Um, so do you think that the second these big automakers, you know, the Fords, the, the Volkswagens, et cetera, um, you know, make space in that market and start selling EVs as like mainstream vehicles, those uh, startups are going to get crowded out or bought up? Or do you think they're here to stay? And as a function of that, do you think that's true for like most industries or startups going to start like becoming dominant players or are they going to, or, or just big companies going to modernize and continue to hold that market? If I were sitting in the Ford Arabian boardroom, it, it, this is tricky because it's not only going to be dependent on Rivian's innovation, it's going to be dependent on, as, as we all know, on uh, rollout of charging stations and widespread adoption of a driving experience that is equal to or superior to the existing internal combustion experience, driving experience. If we were magically endowed with state-of-the-art charging stations uh, tomorrow, uh, to me, that would materially enhance uh, a superior startup. I think the danger for a Rivian is a slower than expected. The, the majors are sort of playing it cozy. They are essentially saying to themselves, this will be a part of our future and it's going to grow slowly because we can see there's still some barriers to widespread adoption. And they can afford and they know that they have the internal combustion engine for the next three to five years that they will do just fine. So I think the answer really, in my mind, depends on on uh, just how widespread the excitement factor is when models start coming out and are buyers ready to plunk down the money knowing that they still might have issues on range. So I, I, it's a little tricky because of the range anxiety issue. Yeah, gotcha. Um, I guess kind of related to that, um, it seems like we are dealing with range pretty well right now, especially on the upper tier of the market. So, I mean, for instance, Mercedes dropped the EQS, I think earlier today, and it has 477 miles of range. It's like comparable to the S class. It's basically a pet petrol car in terms of range. Um, but on the other hand, it costs as much as an S class. It's $80,000. Um, and the same is true for Lucid Motors, Tesla. I mean, the cars with the range that ameliorates the uh, range anxiety also cost as much as petrol cars. Um, so do you think we need to drive innovation on the lower end of the market, you know, where like the ID3 is for Volkswagen, um, or do you think that technology is naturally going to trickle down there? Well, uh, it, 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 it will naturally trickle down in the way that uh, it always has. And I, I think if you probably look back at 2005, or, 2000, or I'm sorry, 1905, Carl's car's unaffordable, Henry Ford comes along, Carl's car's affordable. Uh, that curve, there's no reason to think that that curve isn't gonna take place here with economies of scale and with Volkswagen being able to bring the price down. Uh, the wild card here, which we haven't faced before is, will, will, there, will, will there be an effective enough uh, speed up of the charging at of the of battery technology and charging stations to fast forward the natural curve of, of mass production bringing down price. 
So, I mean, you sound like you're right on top of this stuff. And, and you know, in, in, in five years, we won't be having this discussion because I think in five years, you'll clearly have a bunch of cars in the 20 to 40,000 range, uh, at, which have sufficient range. The, the issue is between now and then, at what speed do you bring those, can, can you bring those lower cost cars onto the market? Yeah, gotcha. Um, and I guess like another area of technology that I wanted to get into kind of related to battery tech um, is the issue of like pollution um, relating to like sustainable materials. So, I mean, rare earth mining is like extremely polluting and also it's, we're dependent on a foreign market. And one option is that we domesticize the market and start, uh, you know, creating domestic supply chains for rare earths. Um, but I think another big part of the EQS and Mercedes general plan in terms of EVs is to make their batteries less dependent on rare earths. Um, do you think that like either of those are a better option? And is there a way that like we can make a choice as a country to, to go in that direction or to not? Uh, not clear. I, I think it's a, it's a superb question. I. I am not familiar enough from what I understand a battery technology advance. We're, we're not close within two to four years, let's say, of a fundamental change in the lithium ion battery. Um, look out 10 years, we may be. So again, I'd say to you, it's, it's, it's a very good question and a close call, but I, I think the weight of the evidence right now is we're going to be stuck with we're going to be stuck with lithium ion. We're going to be stuck with existing incremental advances to existing battery technology for the foreseeable future. And we we you know we, we, the world the world is dependent on China. Europe is dependent on China. We're dependent on China. That doesn't necessarily have to change. If China continues to process rare earths in increasing amount and supply the world's automakers, so you're really talking about uh, what amounts to a national security issue in in our wanting to uh, build a domestic supply chain. It's not required, if you will, if if the market functions and China doesn't use their dominance geopolitically, so to speak. So. I, 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 hope, I hope that battery technology rapidly advances. And until a couple of years ago, I would have said we're underinvested in new battery technologies and underinvested in the R&D. I think that's rapidly changing. And I'm not, a, I'm not a chemist, so I'm not gonna be able to predict for you whether that's gonna bear fruit. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, now I just want to zoom out on electric cars for a second um, and kind of talk about whether this is the right thing to be putting this much money into the first place, because um, we already have pretty low carbon ground transportation issues. I mean, high speed rail um, in non urban areas or rural areas and especially like light rail in urban areas and buses. Um, we already have that technology and it's much lower carbon and for that matter on the justice side. Uh, it probably improves transportation equity. Um, so do you think that we should be putting this money, this much money into electric cars? Um, or do you think we should be rerouting it into like more general transit solutions? I think the way that the Biden administration is planning to. Well, I, the answer has to be both. And just take China as a, for instance, uh, China has seen absolutely no alternative as they build out their society to doing both. Um, and, and they're doing both, frankly, uh, more successfully than we are. Uh, their high-speed rail system is, you know, ours could be fit in 5% uh, of, their, of their rail system. So, but does that mean, does that mean they're trying, they feel there's a viable path to displacing the private automobile? And the answer in China's case is clearly no. They, so they are, I think the answer the answer there is for their billion four they have they have to do both. So I 
you know, we don't we don't have any practical alternative to continue to try and improve the, the private automobile. Uh, we just don't have we don't have the ability to move everybody in every which way. Uh, if you look at our interstate highways, we can't easily replace <clears throat> our interstate highways. Forget about urban transportation. I, I would I would love to see vastly increased expenditures on urban clean transportation, but you're really talking about inner city travel and traveling to see the kids and the grandkids and traveling to jobs and traveling to this and vacationing. So we don't, we don't have any alternative, but to try to do our best to make the private automobile a, a much less polluting vehicle as fast as we can. Mr. Bonnet, just to quickly pivot a little bit from uh, electric vehicles, another area that we really should touch on is nuclear, uh, which a lot of people are saying that should really gradually become an important component of the energy mix, global energy mix, in order to be a, a key part of the solution for, for climate change. And one method for building uh, that green energy base in the U.S., as you've advocated for, is the implementation of small modular reactors, SMR. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit more about these and how they uh, could be a much less risky uh, prospect uh, in, in terms of a much more implementable prospect compared to the traditional huge nuclear reactors that we often think about? Yes, again, I should, I should preface this, but I'm by no means an expert, um, but I, I've been able at the Council on Competitiveness to uh, work with the directors of the, of the national labs over the last several years. And that's been an extraordinarily valuable experience. And my views, if you will, on SMRs and their evolution have been really uh, uh, informed by Tom Mason, who's now head of Los Alamos National Laboratory and really one of the leaders of our international lab system. And, I, and I'll just so clearly remember a conversation we had probably three, four years ago, talking about when they were three, four years earlier than they are now. I uh, said, yeah, the, the uh, New Scale, the, the Oregon company is farthest along. They're going to receive their conditional licenses within a couple of years, that happened. Uh, and he said, I said, well, what, you know, what's, what's, what's driving a success or failure of, of that kind of rollout. And he said, uh, and I'll just never forget this, he said, France. And I said, what, what does that mean? And he said, what that company is going to need is a national champion. What that company is going to need is some national government or the EU, for example, uh, to fund the production of a number of prototypes at varying scales and sizes to prove the concept and to bring down the cost. And I thought, and ever since I tried to, now once I understood what he was getting at, I tried to understand what is happening in that area. And from that insight, uh, I've tried to keep up a little bit with new scale and New Scale, he's exactly right, of course. What New Scale badly needs is a major investment from a national player to begin to prove the concept. And one prediction, and I have no way of knowing whether this is even remotely on anybody's radar, but at COP26 in Glasgow, and as, as the Biden administration does its climate summit, uh, John Kerry or some other, some other figure, I hope, will say that smaller, more modular nuclear reactors must be a part of the solution and begin to build the rhetorical base for, for countries who all have to meet their 2030 obligations for one or more of them to say, in our case, 
in our country if we can if we can get those reactors built at a much lower cost without there being the giant dinosaurs that have caused so much trouble, we'll give it a try. So I would look to, I would look to that kind of breakthrough as what we badly need because we're all stuck in a mindset that nuclear is yesterday's technology because of Fukushima, because of Chernobyl, because of uneconomic and, and over complexity. So it's been widely written off as a climate solution. And I think frankly, most environmental profiles have relatively small uh, allocations to nuke. And in my view, with, without being an expert, and I'll keep saying it, that's wrong. We're gonna need smaller scale nuclear in a lot of countries. And we need one or more of those countries to say, uh, this should be a part of our energy planning over the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah, I mean, so if national uh, support, I guess, for a nuclear program is so important, do you think gaining that is feasible? I mean, I know that France has a very different relationship with nuclear than certainly America and a lot of other countries. Um, but still, I mean, activists ranging from like old school environmentalists uh, and NIMBYs all have their issues with nuclear. Uh, do you think that those issues are going to be uh, dealt with because they're small and modular, or do you think those are still going to exist and that's going to be something that governments have to get around? Oh, I, I you know, your coin toss, uh, coin toss. Um, I, I, I only know how to answer that by saying we are at a moment where we're not, we, the body politic and those who follow this stuff closely, I think in a year's time, we are all going to have a broader, more global outlook on what it's going to take uh, to keep climate change at bay. And we haven't yet really, globalize the problem. And a big part of it in here in the States has been the last four years. And without going any deeper into that, it's to say that we deglobalized ourselves uh, on issues like this uh, in, the last, in the last four years. And now we need to re-globalize ourselves rapidly uh, from this moment forward. It's not only small scale nukes, it's any, any number of other technologies where the realization that the, that the answer is going to lie in all of the above and not just in the States and not just in China or India, everywhere, um, is going to, I think, broaden the debate, so to speak. And that's the only way I not answer your question. And it's a hope, it's a maybe naive answer, but it's a hopeful answer. Uh, with, with more discussion will come, I hope a realization that these can be lower cost, they can be safe, and they can within 10 to 20 years have a real impact. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Um, I guess like relating to questions of scale, um, one thing that I've seen in terms of uh, grid modernization in general, and this relates to SMRs, um, is like two competing ideas. So one is that we should be uniting the national grid um, and, and make large scale renewables like uh, cheaper through big projects. Uh, it would make them more efficient. It would mitigate intermittency. Um, but then also there's another trend that's uh, kind of built around SMRs, um, which is that uh, grids should be localized to the systems they exist in um, and renewable projects should be like small and manageable. Uh, do you think those are actually like diametrically imposed? Do you think they both will exist? Um, and if so, like which do you think is the better direction to go in? Oh gosh. Uh, you know, I did do a number of utility financings back in my Wall Street period. So I've always followed the utilities. I mean, as you know, we have uh, a robust 
uh, set of utility companies that are sophisticated, they're strong, they're, they're highly regulated. Uh, most of them for sure, I believe, would say that we, that we must put significant additional resources in strengthening, modernizing, and interconnecting the grid, Texas being a perfect example of what, what happens when you don't. Uh, so I think the utility answer would be no, not, not, to, not to decentralize, but to continue to centralize uh, while, uh, while, you know, I, I, and, and I'm, uh, this isn't a principle kind of point, but it maybe, maybe makes the point. Um, large scale commercial decentralization is one thing, individual rooftop uh util some utilities would say that's very hard to manage so you know that's it's not a it's not a i don't think it's an either or but i think the the better answer here is grid interconnectedness and modernization and able able to uh able to cope with and encourage much larger scale renewables in solar and wind. Gotcha. Um, and do you think that that kind of centralization process is a public policy issue? I mean, I know that Texas is intentionally disconnected from the rest of the national grid because they want to avoid national uh, regulation. But do you think that now that like private utility companies have seen what can happen uh, when they're unregulated like that, they're going to want to centralize? Um, or is this a regulatory issue that the Biden administration has to unpack? Well, I, I uh, regulatory issue, and I wouldn't put Texas as an outlier before and after. And as you know, utility regulation in this country is, is 50 state. By and large, it's not primarily FERC but it's primarily state utility regulation and state utility regulation is, uh, can be all over the map in terms of, uh, of, of uh, its degree of encouragement of, of interconnectedness and transmission across transmission lines across state lines. So I am not gonna hazard a prediction on, on what, what the Biden administration can do there. That one I have not studied. Uh, I would think where we're headed would just, would absolutely require some greater degree of federal guidance on interconnectedness and strengthening of FERC and permitting and encouraging larger scale wind and solar for sure. But the path to that, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not, conversant enough to comment. Uh, Mr. Bonnet, I know we spent a bit of time previously talking about investments. So maybe I, I would love to quickly pivot back a little bit and, and, and talk to you about uh, the idea of greenwashing. And, and I think maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about it. Um, there's a lot of movements within investment funds and big corporations to do this thing called ESG, uh, Environmental and Social Governance, which is the framework of criteria that used to uh, judge whether a company's standards for socially environmental, uh, whether they are socially and environmentally friendly enough and conscious enough. So um, a lot of funds have, have done these ESG funds and, and uh, call on college campuses, people are talking about divesting from uh, fossil fuel. W what do you think of this industry-wide effort? I, maybe it's net positive, maybe it's net, ne net, net negative. Do you think we're going further enough uh, what are your overall th thoughts on that? I suppose I am slightly, but not dramatically, on the cynical side. I suppose it. I suppose it depends on what side of the bed I'm waking up in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it. It. It's. It's a. You know. Overall, of course, it's a net positive. And of course, of course, it's being manipulated in slow walk is, is how I would term it. Um, you saw Exxon uh, wants to cut its, quote, carbon intensity 
by 2050, and there's objections to that as not committing to net zero by 2050. That's a it's a it's a Chinese gambit in China. Also, they are they are a carbon intensity kind of guideline country, and not an absolute uh, uh, decline country right now. So, I, I, yes, it it it's going to it's the beginning of a movement that's going to have to be tightened up. It's going to have to be be progressively more. Uh, uh, definitive in its in its goals and metrics. It's going to. You look out ten years. It will. It will be. It will be much more defined because it will have to be much more defined in terms of goals that corporations have to meet. So we're still at the voluntary phase. There's, I would term, some pressures from the financial markets. That's resulted in some progress. I, uh, you know, it's it, some of this is at the moment is largely rhetorical. So it's, I, I sort of think of it as a precursor to to and a beginning of a preparation in the boardroom towards a shifting of actual capital expenditures. So it's actual dollars. That are going to uh, prove to be the difference here, as a, as of course you would know. But it's it's so the the ESG to the extent it pushes that process faster, of course it's a good thing. But it's it's uh, it's subject to a little manipulation in the short run, for sure. Yeah, I mean relating to that movement of actual capital, um, I mean some companies have actually done that, especially in the wake of the presidential election. I mean, for instance, GM pledged to be uh, zero emissions, I think, in their lineup by 2035. Um, do you think some of that is just a function of Democrats being in the White House and uh, Democrats promising to pass a bill that's hopefully going to hand out R&D money and all kinds of other projects? Uh, or do you think that's here to stay and is going to stick around even under a Republican administration? Oh. Well, I, you know, I, um, we're we're only we're only part way home, but I the I hope and every day learn and take heart just a teeny bit more that the discussion is shifting from partisanship to the problem. And you know, I think one way to answer that question is, uh, and it's funny, I just read it in the journal the other day and I'm not, I need to bone up on it, but there's a, there's a longstanding, uh, George Schultz is not with us anymore, James Baker is, but there's a Schultz-Baker plan for carbon pricing that would be considered in the pre-Trump era, to be a Trump era, to be a quintessentially Republican plan, so to speak. If you're going to if you're going to tackle, you have to tackle climate change. You do it in a way that's the most market friendly, and you do it to provide the fastest kind of transition to carbon neutral technologies. And the the, the traditional Republican view is you do that through the market and car a carbon tax or carbon credits or a trading system. And that's the best solution. Now, the kind of Republican administration we had uh, didn't pick up on that or anything else. Now you have a democratic administration where this kind of more quintessentially market solution is taking a backseat to more of a government intervention solution. So uh, it's a problem that has to be solved. And if we were to get a Republican administration, you could only pray that the Republicans would turn to a market solution. Uh, but but the, the problem doesn't go away. The problem doesn't, the, the atmosphere doesn't care who's a, whether it's a Democrat or Republican president. So it's, uh, 
I every day I you know I think about are we moving finally past partisanship into policy and a vigorous debate on what are the best policies to solve the problem. It, it seems so, that I'm, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it, it seems that we're anything but moving away from partisanship. It's it's very hard because it seems that not even the Republicans could get on board with something like carbon tax, which supposedly would be a free market-based solution. So some would even argue that in order to solve for climate change, you would have to do it without the Republicans or something like that. Yeah, I listen, I, I understand. I, I understand. <laughs> I understand my naivete here, but I- No, I, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but the truth of the matter is, we have to solve this problem. It has to be solved worldwide. And I think I think another point to make here is it has to be viewed beyond a partisan lens because we are only one country among 196 that together has to solve the problem. So again, my previous point about globalizing the problem, re-globalizing the problem is an important one. I hope beginning in November that will move us a little past this this total gridlock situation we're in now. It, well, policy punch, we, we are not a uh, quote unquote partisan uh, organization. So it's not like we're backing one side or the other, but I'm very curious to, to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on this idea between quote unquote, the more liberal uh, view of solving climate change and the more conservative free market based view, because um, a lot of people are, are saying uh, the government should not be investing billions or trillions of dollars into green tech because you don't want to be, you know, quote unquote, picking the winners or picking the losers, whereas the markets always solve it out, uh, sort it out. And uh, since we are in a very friendly market environment, it seems that the markets will be able to do that just fine. So, uh, Mr. Bonet, I don't know, over your long course of career, do you have any thoughts on, on this matter? Do you, for example, uh, what do you think of the, the, our policy in the past four years during the Trump administration? Do you think uh, that kind of uh, l letting markets sorting itself out, the government not really doing anything to tackle climate change, do you think that perspective, that, that approach was working just fine in some way? Uh, or do you think we need a more hands-on approach uh, from like Biden administration to say, I'm going to do a $2 trillion infrastructure plan that is very much targeted at a uh, green tech and so on. So uh, do you have any stance on this? Well, again, uh, the, Trump the Trump administration uh, uh, exited the Paris Climate Accord. So let's start with the fact that we were not, we, were, it's not, we, had, we had no position, we were not a part of it. So understand that our re-entry in the, in the Paris Accord uh, reintroduces the debate that we're now having about what, what the best approach is. But it's, it's uh, you did not in fact have the investment uh, uh, that because there was, there was no official government position that there was even a problem. So I, I don't, I, you know, I, you're now to the point where we can begin a debate, re-begin a debate on what the best approaches are, and it's going to occupy Washington for years. And everybody's going to have a different take on it. Uh, there's no question this, this debate, the first I remember this debate was in maybe 2002, when I first learned about the Kyoto Protocol, but roughly 20 years ago, began to study it uh, uh, when, I was, when I was a part of uh, uh, both the Environmental Defense Fund and the World Resources Institute and looked at the failures back in a re under a Republican administration to uh, be a part of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and then the next major inflection point came in 2009 with the beginning of the Obama administration where there was an abortive attempt uh, to, to uh, get action on any, any fundamental climate change uh, legislation, which I, my recollection, it didn't even come up for a formal Senate vote. So there was essentially no 
there's been no, virtually no support in the United States Senate, uh, no, nothing close to majority support and only very tepid minority support for any kind of carbon tax or carbon credit or carbon trading system. Uh, and that's been true for now 20 years. So uh, it, it's hardly fair for me to characterize it as a debate because it really hasn't been a debate. So, and you're absolutely right, it's not a debate now. Uh, there is no robust debate on a carbon tax, which a number of economists would say would be the single best solution. So that's where we are. And we have a democratic administration, which is using uh, a variety of tools to try and jumpstart our, our, our economy and our corporate response to climate change. And all, all someone who's interested in the field can do is, is, is wish the Biden administration success because it represents some progress for sure. Yeah, I kind of want to talk about that, that progression from 2010 to 2020. Um, like you mentioned, 2010, uh, Waxman Markey, a pretty moderate uh, climate tax bill, uh, passed through the, the House of Representatives, flying colors, and then dead, or not, dead on arrival in, in the Senate. Um, and then you, you uh, flash, fast forward to 2020, and you have this massive infrastructure bill, which, among other things, puts a huge amount of money towards like renewable uh, energy. And I, I can't help but think that that movement away from like this new neoliberal conception of governance, um, which like drives the free market in the right direction, as opposed to a kind of government that invests in people and solutions, and in some ways does pick the winners. Do you think the, the, the nature of that solution is the reason why it's getting more support and more action in the Senate? I mean, do you think that's like the direction that the electorate and also like the body politic is moving in? What, and I'm sorry, what, what, what direction is that, if you could restate that? Uh, like away from uh, a neoliberal state that basically like drives uh, market action and towards a more activist state that invests in people and solutions uh, before driving the market. Well, The Council on Competitiveness, of which I'm a member, has a major initiative on innovation, which, which predates this administration. Uh, and to our great delight, the Biden administration has picked up on a number of the main themes in our, in, in our interim innovation report. One of, one of the major recommendations is that we, uh, as a country, commit to restoring federally funded R&D to something like its historic norm of 2% of GDP over my lifetime. It has gone from 2% of GDP down to, I think it's 0.6% or 0.5% of GDP. <coughs> and the leaders of which, with which I have talked on in a, at corporate level and the national lab level view it as absolutely essential that we have a much more robust federally funded R&D, which equates quite nicely with what our needs are for transformative technology, for example, in, in, in batteries, in, in grid strengthening, in nukes, and uh, uh, you know other other technologies that can really promote a much more rapid transition to to a clean energy. So I I don't know how to answer that except by saying uh, part part of what we have to do is have federally led investment, which can lead to. <clears throat> Uh, a robust corporate investment. That's always been the pipeline that we've undertaken in this country. Carbon capture being a very good example. It's not yet a commercially viable technology. Uh, funding R&D there could, 
increase it could shorten that timeline. So it's a classic case of R and D helping nurture and jumpstart a market. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, and as you mentioned, you are a member on the U.S. Council of Competitiveness. Um, and so you clearly believe in maintaining the U.S.'s role as a, if not the uh, global leader. Um, but, you know, the U.S., as we've kind of talked about, is a lot more flaky on climate issues, especially than its European counterparts. Um, so, like, what's your case for the U.S. maintaining its role as a global leader in climate change? I mean, do you think that they're best suited for that position, or do you think we should let uh, the EU kind of take the lead there? Oh, I don't think it's a question of letting. I, uh, I, I, can, I can only answer by, by saying um, we nurture the, the best combination. We always have nurtured the best combination, NASA being a good example. Uh, space travel being a good example. Our federally funded R&D has led to a robust, uh, robust innovation pipeline, which has funded hundreds of, of innovative US companies. And it, it, the, the beauty of that innovation pipeline is it's not really, I, I, I would stay away from, uh, a sort of a national uh, champion or picking out sectors that where we're going to concentrate. That's never been where what we've been best in. What we've been best in is creating the conditions for new market entrants to have enough running room and to have enough backing of their ideas through federally funded research that they've got a shot at being at, at, at getting a $500 million SPAC investment. So I, I can only answer, I don't think our future is in saying, we're going to choose to do X, but not Y. This is an all of the above uh, where, where if, 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 if Europe leads in some areas, so be it. If we lead in other areas, I really think the much more pregnant question is what role is China going to play in terms of in terms of uh, technology enablement, helping helping India, for example, which which badly needs help in its clean energy quest. Southeast Asian countries. So you could have a, another day's discussion on the role of China in the next ten years, and I'm sure that's occupying Secretary Kerry right now. Yeah, Mr. Bonnet, you uh, brought up China, globalization, a lot of those global interdependence and, and collaborations. Maybe we should quickly touch on that. You mentioned your experience in the Philippines. Uh, I also know you do some work in Africa and other places. So maybe we could talk a little bit more on, on that front, where you see things shaping when it comes to global cooperation. What are some of the interesting projects that really uh, fascinate you nowadays? Well, let's take an easy one, although it's, it's, uh... It's, uh, it's the more you get into it, the more complex it is. Uh, the World Economic Forum last year uh, introduced what they call 1T.org and T standing for trillion. And on the basis of some reputable studies, the World Economic Forum uh, has made it a policy initiative of it to create national chapters around the world with the overall goal of planning or conserving or restoring one trillion trees by 2030. Uh, as I'm sure you two know, um, natural solutions uh, which is a whole other area, but let's just take trees as a, one component of natural solution, can provide some meaningful uh, percentage of the carbon reduction and sequestration that we need to meet our climate change goals. 
something like 15 to maybe even 20%. So if we were to be able to do that, to plant a trillion trees in the next 10 years, that would be, uh, that would be meaningful. Uh, I'm After this call, I have a call with the CEO of American Forest, where I'm on the board. And we at American Forest are the US chapter leader, I think it's fair to say, of the, of the US part of the effort towards a trillion trees. And we, you can go to a website, 1t.org, and we've enlisted so far you know, a couple dozen partners, uh, corporate partners, government partners, and are off to what we consider to be a reasonably strong start. Last time I checked, we had commitments to plant 1.1 billion trees. Okay, now let's do the math. I was never good at math, but last I checked, one billion trees is one-tenth of 1% 1 of a trillion trees. So the, the scope of what we're trying to do and the difficulty of that to make a meaningful dent is daunting to say the least. Now, what do I mean by the right way or the most productive, sustainable way to do that? If you go to the 1t.org website, you will see that there is a major effort underway in the Sahel in Central Africa to, to build a great green wall of trees. And I don't know what the numbers are. It's a huge number of trees. It's, it's, it's been in existence for several years and it's ramping up now with the backing of this uh, World of this WEF initiative. And there's a good example. This is the Sahara is encroaching on uh, the, the tropics and it is leading to, to desertification of vast tracts of land. And it is a livelihood and survival issue in Central Africa in the Sahel to have the Great Green Wall halt this encroaching desert. So that's a solution. That's planting trees. It is also a major economic and human development uh, uh, problem solver. So it's a very good example in my mind of how we should look at issues like this as, as opportunities to do as much as we can to improve quality of life and not just, uh, not just engage in climate change alone. So it's, it's, it's a, we can work globally in areas of relatively little conflict. Uh, uh, the Amazon, being a, being a very good example, uh, conserving as much as we can in the Amazon, creating the right set of incentives, really halting any more <coughs> clear cutting. So I think there's a two, two areas where global cooperation could have a meaningful effect without a lot of geopolitical uh, pushback. Yeah, I mean, I think that Sahel example was really illuminating to me because one of the questions I had is, I kind of thought that the conservation and environmental movement as a whole had kind of moved past this discussion of trees because they're not as effective at carbon capture as like technologies that we may be able to create. And they only hold that carbon for as long as that they're alive. Um, but it sounds like there's uh, also economic and equity related uh, downstream effects that are also important. But do you see this as like a big carbon capture uh, solution or do you think that we're actually going to need to create technology as well? Oh, I, you know, no doubt. I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with your premise. Let's just briefly touch on two other, two other uh, subsets. Um, and again, like, <laughs> like in so many areas today, I'm not an agriculture expert, but soil conservation, uh, re reforming 
agricultural practices leading to leading to less soil degradation, uh, more vigorous crop rotation, a whole host of issues. And draw, the book Drawdown does a good job on agricultural stuff. Um, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend I'm an expert, but I use it as illustrative of uh, of of the of the of the non technology, if you will, or low low tech kind of solutions that can lead to both better climate and better equity. Um, you know, I had a conversation yesterday on um, uh, urban food deserts and local local garden local gardening, the Whole Foods, uh, uh, Gotham Greens, Bright Farms. There's a nascent movement in this in, in the corporate sector. Companies are starting to get traction, cutting supply chains and growing greens, basil and other lettuces on rooftops and in urban greenhouses. So again, I, I, I less like to stress the, the infinitesimal help of that than I do than I do it's part of what we can all do in different ways to build a more sustainable country and world. And that every little bit is going to contribute to a movement that is still in its infancy. I'll give you another example. Uh, at the Smithsonian, we are uh, natural shorelines people. And there is a a crying, crying need for more attention to be paid to preservation and enhancement of natural shorelines as a, as a and, and preservation and even building of salt marshes as a very effective carbon sequestration strategy. And we don't have the discussion we should be having about what good that would do to save lives in Mumbai or Bangladesh or Shanghai or the 500 million people who are going to be underwater in 2050. So all of the all of these things, all of these different mini, if you will, solutions contribute to solving the problem, but have the other beneficial effect of helping quality of life and helping humans in different ways. Just to quickly follow up on that, Mr. Bonas, since you are very much involved with the Smithsonian Institution and Research Center there, uh, what are the other interesting innovations that are coming up that you think uh, you could give us a sneak peek of? Well, there's an Earth Optimism Summit that the Smithsonian is having. I think it's on the I think it's on the 21st. So so people should tune into that. Uh, the Smithsonian is a robust, and not many people know this is a robust scientific research institution. We have nine research centers. We are, we at STRI, the, our Tropical Research Institute uh, down in Panama, uh, we are the world's largest uh, researcher on the tropics where innovation lies there. And we haven't even touched on this, is the alarming uh, loss of biodiversity that we're now experiencing in part, in some significant part due to climate change and all that needs to be done to preserve and enhance biodiversity, uh, the loss of species under, under, under appreciated how dangerous that can be as we continue to lose the world species. Uh, so the Smithsonian and that kind of fundamental research is critical to, to uh, uh, preserving and enhancing biodiversity. We have, a, we have a, uh, an initiative called uh, Movement of Life. Uh, we have a, one of our other research institutes, we have a Conservation Biology Institute out in Front Royal, Virginia. I like to term it our Noah's Ark, where we take the rarest of rare species that are virtually extinct in the wild and bring them to Front Royal where we can. And over time, 
breed them and try and reintroduce those otherwise extinct species into the wild in the name of biodiversity. We're doing it with cheetahs now, and we did it with the uh, oryx, but, uh, one species of oryx. It's been successfully reintroduced into Africa. So we do a wide variety of, of scientific research in the conservation, biodiversity, and ecology spheres. Uh, anything for a space exploration? Maybe we should all go to go to Mars. That that's the uh, end goal. <laughs> we have our Air and Space Museum um, yeah. uh, closed now, uh, but undergoing an eight hundred million dollar uh, expansion and revitalization. So stay tuned. That'll be terrific in a couple of years when it reopens. Yeah, I want to talk about the Smithsonian in general, um, because it's always been kind of an institution I've been drawn to uh, and appreciate. And so I'm interested kind of like, uh, in your experience as a board member, what has the Smithsonian taught you about the way that the US deploys public capital um, and generally like uh, uses uh, public institutions for the good of its populace? Oh, I think it's a, it's a marvel of, of the federal government and it's a marvel of American life. You, you, it's been an enormous privilege for me. We have, we have uh, uh, I, I think it's 19, maybe now 20, 19 museums, eight research centers, all, all free, all forever free. Uh, no other country has anything close to that. So what, what is the, you know, that's, a, that's, that's the best of America. That's the best of what we can be, free forever to everybody. And it's, uh, I think I've been probably in all the museums and they're all, uh, they all in varying degrees do an absolutely wonderful job of explaining their particular expertise. You know, the Smithsonian, there, uh, there's enormous pressure on the Smithsonian to do as, as much as it, as it is in relatively minor, truly government support. Uh, the, the Congress has now asked the Smithsonian to, uh, to do a women's museum and a Latino museum. This is on the heels now of the African-American museum. So it's a, it's a, you have to start with the proposition that the Smithsonian has some huge, huge challenges ahead of us as we always have and we've always ri risen to the occasion uh, to provide that kind of experience to the American people, but it's not easy, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine that Smithsonian has, I suppose, especially under certain administrations, gotten probably more under pressure, uh, perhaps to start charging or, or start privatizing. I'm not sure if this is a thing that's happened. Um, but you know, in an era, especially in the past 30 years, when a lot of American public institutions have been increasingly privatized or uh, have started charging for their services, um, how has the Smithsonian remained free? And how do you think we can use that, what it's done as like a model for some of our other public institutions? Oh, I, 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 I think it's fair to say that's a core value of ours that, we, that will never change as long as the leadership of the Smithsonian has anything to say about it. And it, again, I just can't emphasize enough how much we feel that that represents the best of what this country can be uh, open to everyone. We have, we have attendance, you know, until COVID in, in the, in the uh, you know, many, many, many millions each year, growing each year. I, I don't know how transferable the money model is. I would answer you by saying that the Smithsonian is an exemplar in so many ways. We have over 200 affiliate, affiliated museums, uh, some of which charge, some of which don't. Uh, I think we're, we're an apostle to do as much as, as any institution can with private philanthropy to, to remain free whenever possible. Uh, I think that's increasingly difficult to do, and the Smithsonian has become. Uh, we have a we have a major development department, and a lot of the progress that we're able to make now is due to private philanthropy. So we get about 
half of our annual total budget from the federal government, uh, other, other, maybe another third from uh, research and, and, and other kinds of government grants, but sure, you know, surely 200, 250 million a year in private giving is what enables us to do what we do. So it's a mixed, the answer, long-winded answer, is it's a, it's a mixed model, which works for us, but it's, it's, it's tough every year, just as, just as cultural institutions countrywide are finding this is a very tough period for them. Uh, Mr. Bonet, uh, we've had uh, almost 90 minutes of conversation now. I, as we gradually wrap up, something on my mind is, uh, do you have any contrarian view that you hold that many of your friends or colleagues might disagree with you about, either on climate issues or something else? Uh, do you have any contrarian views? Well, I, I, I would term what I've tried to do today and what I deeply believe is and all of the above, technology is part but not whole, uh, small scale nukes have a place. Uh, in part, uh, Tiger, I would view all those as contrarian in part uh, because it, it emphasizes that no one, one piece will either sink us or save us. And the waiting for the silver bullet uh, or the trying to plan for the silver bullet is going to be uh, seductive as this, as this, as this, uh, as this uh, problem gets more and more serious. So whether it's contrarian or not, I'm still an optimist uh, that we can solve this in, a, in an all of the above manner but the next 10 years will tell the tale. And if we're, I may not be here, you certainly will, but in 2030, uh, we're gonna need to take a hard look at where we are and look at more radical ways of dealing with this issue. Uh, last question from me. Since the name of our show is Policy Punchline, what would your punchline be for this interview? The, the one takeaway uh, or, or just one punchline? <laughs> Have hope, uh, have hope. The, uh, the train is, is finally moving in a meaningful way. And I'm cautiously optimistic that we can show substantial progress by the, by the year 2030. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. Bonet, for, for joining Sully and me. Uh, it's just been a wonderful conversation. Thank you for ending on a, such a hopeful note. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tiger, for having me. And, and, and this concludes this episode of Policy Punchline. You may learn more about us on policypunchline.com. Uh, we encourage you to watch uh, Mr. Bonate's full webinar uh, on, on either Princeton's YouTube channel where you can simply Google Mr. Bonate's name and, and the Gilbert Lecture Series. A fascinating conversation there uh, as well with Professor Chris Gregg uh, from Princeton who does the net, uh, net path to net zero uh, project here at Princeton. So thank you so much for listening today. Uh, we'll see you next time. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.